Uh, we are here today with Helen Rappaport, who is a best-selling author and a, a very welcome addition to History Twitter, who appeared during the pandemic, possibly before the pandemic. And... I've been on Twitter for a while, but yes. I, hadn't really, I hadn't really found that the historians I wanted and needed to talk to. So I was very grateful through you to get into the Napoleonic period, but also other historians I know well, who are mainly, I have to say, Tudor historians. Yes. <laughs> the, there's this fanaticism on the web about the Tudors. I get, I get rather bored with it, but there are some excellent historians, particularly women historians I know in mm. that genre. Mm -hmm. um, not so many on the Russian side. I mean, Simon Seabag's up there and one or two others. But um, so it was really good to get into your area. Well, I mean, I was delighted to to see your response uh, when I had when I casually just sort of said, you know, um, uh, Napoleonic Twitter will be happy to help you out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I've been doing little little missions for you uh, over the uh, over the over the course of the year. Um, to help you out with your book, uh, upcoming book, uh, uh, which is about um, you, the wife of the um, the, the Grand infamous Duke yes, the infamous <laughs> Grand Duke Constantine. Um, well, how well known is he in Napole Napoleonic <laughs> studies? Because I'm, I was curious to know. I found it really quite difficult to find anything very much about mm. his specific career in the Napoleonic campaigns, which he went. He went first in the what was it, autumn winter of seventeen ninety nine. Um, but it's 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 really it's not really well covered in Russian sources. Yeah, um, with Constantine, it's. He's infamous if you if you know about him, um, and mm -hmm. if you know about him, you're probably a Russianist, because um, mm -hmm. you may have picked this up from Napoleonic Twitter. Uh, but the majority of Napoleonic studies is dominated by uh, British and French studies. Uh, yeah. yeah, and so the only way you're going to read about the Russians is if you're studying the French up to a mm -hmm. point. It's getting much better. There are actual people uh, working solidly on Russian the Russian army and the yeah. Russian effort and most famously um that was kicked off by Dominic Levin uh mm. who's who wrote um Russia against Napoleon which is considered the bent sort of like the 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 founding book <laughs> of of new Russian studies um but Constantine and there's that big new yeah. biography Kutuzov of course he's much more famous really he is, um, yes. In, in the wider European context, because of Tolstoy, of Indeed. course, mm -hmm. and War and Peace, mm -hmm. which but is at the, my at the time, one. at the time, people like Konstantin would have looked up to Suvorov, obviously, because yeah. he. Um... But he, he came back disgraced from the Alp campaign, didn't he? He's he, it... been a bit of a fiasco. There had been, yes, um, yes. As far as I remember it. Um, as much as a prince, as a, as much as a, a imperial prince can be disgraced when he returns from war, he he it wasn't a great moment for him. It, it did. If you ever, I mean, if you ever look at his career, if you ever look at sort of the 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 stars of the Russian army, he never appears amongst them. You know, he he commands yeah. divisions and things like that mostly because he's a prince, but he's never respected as a general, and that's mm. probably because he messed up under Suvorov um mm. and he got he, he did sort of basically do what he did best which was to rule the roost at, in staff headquarters and therefore get a certain leverage over Suvorov towards the end of the campaign but he didn't shine in it no he was and then he was hyped off to Poland wasn't he Constantin yes, yes. and became what was he a governor of Poland it's something like that isn't it something it's... like governor. I, I haven't to be honest um, my interest in him ends when Julie gets away from him my subject well Julianne. yes let, let's talk a little about her she sounds like a much nicer person <laughs> Well, she's very, very interesting, if only because she's been completely overlooked. Um, you know, everyone talks about Queen Victoria's mother, Victoire, who was of the same family. She was the youngest sister of um, Julie. Her full name was Julianne um, Ulrika Henrietta or Henrietta Ulrika. I can't remember which way around. 
But her, her, her younger sister, Victoire, was very famous for being Victoria's mother mm -hmm. because she married the Duke of Kent. Mm -hmm. And of course, the youngest brother, Leopold, who became King of the Belgians, did mm -hmm. very well for himself. And various other members of the family all in various ways managed managed to marry pretty well and kind of up, um, you know, promote the family beyond the limitations of sex coburg So mm -hmm. they all did pretty well as a family. Yeah, but Julianne was born in 1781 and um, she and her two um, others, uh, the elder two sisters, um, Sophie and Antoinette, were put in a carriage with their mother and sent off to be inspected by Catherine the Great in <laughs> 1795 as candidates for the for her her grandson Constantine. Now, three years two years previously, she'd married off Alexander, later mm -hmm. Alexander the First, to a, another German princess called Louise Louise of Baden, who became Elisaveta Alexeyevna. And Catherine had equal grand ambitions for Constantine. She wanted to see him as sort of a re, an in, reinstalled emperor of, mm -hmm. of the Ottoman territories. She had these grand ambitions, hence his name, Constantine. And also the fact that he was brought up by a Greek nanny and taught Greek as a child. Mm -hmm. um, so when he hit 16 in 1795, Catherine had, had, had sort of sent the scouts out. <laughs> <laughs> in Germany for, for a nice suitable German princess for him like Louise of Baden who'd been mm -hmm. married off to his brother and various candidates were suggested and rejected and then finally um, she was told about these three pretty sisters in Saxe-Coburg the daughters of Prince Franz and Princess Auguste who were the heirs to the dukedom uh, and so Auguste um, after a bit of correspondence with Catherine, got in a coach with the three girls and did this astonishing coach ride. Um, and this is a kind of one of the, the parts of the book I most enjoyed writing in the first section was describing this coach journey yeah. from Coburg all the way up to St. Petersburg and, and in approaching winter. Mm -hmm. um, and they, I think it took just over 40 days and they went there to be inspected. And um, Constantine was totally reluctant about really about getting married. And he wasn't ready for marriage any more than poor Julianne was, but she was chosen. Mm. And she was only 14. So she was mm. a, you know, one of these several sacrificial German brides married into various dynasties yeah, at so that time. As 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 we were saying just before we pressed the record button, the complexity of the marriage market, as you might call it, in yeah. central Germany at this point is in, is is utter insanity, um, just because of the complexity of the political system that's there yeah. as well. And what <clears throat> and so, um, Julie, what 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 have you found out about her so far i mean do you do you sort of like her what what's what's her personality looking like at the second she is quite an enigmatic personality quite difficult to pin down because there are gaps in the record mm -hmm. and some of her uh, you know letters have been lost and she didn't seem to have kept any diaries she was a very strong-willed personality very vivacious and very uh, charming and pretty and attractive personality. And clearly when, when, when she went to Russia with the two other sisters, everyone found her very engaging and lively, but she was also, I think, very impetuous. Mm -hmm. And um, she had great difficulty with Constantine in her marriage. I mean, God, I, I, I dread to think what it was like to be married at 14, with no knowledge or understanding of sex or childbirth or anything. And um, so she was very young, very impressionable, very alone. Mm -hmm. I mean, she was lucky that when she um, was left in St. Petersburg, because after she was chosen, 
Catherine the Great wanted to get shot of her mother, who'd become a bit of an, anno an annoyance to her because she was rather ingratiating. So the, the mother and the two sisters were put on the coach back to Saxe Coburg. And there's Julie left in St. Petersburg with not a word of Russian. Mm. Luckily, of course, they all spoke French and she spoke French. And of course, Yelizaveta Alexeyevna, Alexander's wife, mm -hmm. was a fellow German. So those two gravitated together. And she became very, very close to Elisabetta, who mm -hmm. then, of course, went on to become empress. But as such, she was terribly isolated and so very vulnerable mm -hmm. and um, deeply unhappy in the marriage. I, mm -hmm. I can't quite decide whether he was, he could be anything, I, I, he might have been autistic. He certainly suffered from attention deficit disorder of some kind. Um, but I'm wondering if he might even have been bipolar because he could be quite kind and nice to the people he liked and then become extremely violent. Mm, fascinating. Frighteningly violent. He was very violent at times towards Julie. Um, so whether it was bipolar or possibly schizophrenic, you know, one doesn't like to try and make diagnosis he he definitely was he had mental problems mm -hmm. i think he, you know he was known i mean the first alarming accounts i found of him were of what a brute he was to his soldiers mm. yes um he he has that sort of reputation as well in <clears throat> in uh, excuse me in uh, military circles as well really as a a, a person of several personalities almost um so you, that that tallies with what i know about him as a soldier uh, in terms of most people respected his bravery that he he led well in battle and things he wasn't a coward uh people respected that but at the same time he was mercurial and um did he because he was because of the way he was brought up um as well there was a great emphasis on the discipline of soldiers a very harsh yeah. prussian discipline um, well that was his father who was yes. fanatical yes. Mm. about the the almost uh, out, out outmoded obsolete methods of soldiering mm. from sort of frederick the great's time wasn't exactly. he exactly and he was an absolute obsessive mm -hmm. about drilling and parades and you know stand by your beds at 5 a.m yes. and uh, from young ages alexander and constantine both were all commanded to go out to gatchina for all these endless tedious parades and drills mm -hmm. and and he said quite early on in you know in the marriage he said quite candidly i think it was to la harp his tutor you know there's only one thing that interests me and that's soldiering and being a soldier and he mm -hmm. had that mentality and he admitted to his, uh, that that was all he was capable of really mm -hmm. he admitted to his own insensitivities mm -hmm. and unfortunately he and julie were just chalk and cheese she was very young, very sweet, very engaging, very trusting, but completely overwhelmed by his very erratic personality. So mm. in 1799, when um, he went off on the Italian campaign um, to join Suvorov, she begged to be allowed to go home to visit her family because she hadn't seen them in, you know, go back to Coburg. She hadn't seen them since... Uh, 1795 mm -hmm. um, but she left having confided to mm -hmm. Grand Duchess Elisabetta and to Alexander to whom she was very very close um, that she didn't she wasn't going to come back if she possibly mm -hmm. could she was not going to come back but unfortunately um, she was forced to um, come back a f six months later uh, there was kind of moral and mental blackmail going on, but she mm. was forced to go back. But a lot, lot of it was due to the fact that her family were appalled. You know, they didn't want her to <laughs> well, duck <laughs> out of this marriage to to Russia, the prestige, uh -huh. well, of course, the money. I mean, she was sending money home to her parents, to her father, constantly. In fact, the his surviving letters to her that I've got from the Coburg archives are all begging letters asking for money all the time. Mm -hmm. So she was put under a lot of pressure to wow. go back. 
And when she went back, it was interesting because she hadn't seen Constantin for, what, six months or more. He comes back at the end of the year, the sort of conquering hero after the Italian campaign. And for a while, he's quite nice to her. (laughs) And she thought he was a reformed character, Mm -hmm. but it didn't last very long, Mm. unfortunately. Mm. Unfortunately. Uh, She sounds like a fascinating person. Like, I'm sorry, (laughs) I have to clear my throat all the time, apparently. But yeah, uh, she sounds like a fascinating subject and a fascinating person. Uh, not least because I believe you, you. I don't know if you want to give this away or not, but she she actually leaves Constantine? Oh, no, it's not. I mean, it's there to, to be found out. Um, yes, she, she managed to get away again, of course, for good in 1801 after the murder of Tsar Paul. Right. And um, she begged Alexander to let her leave, and she was able to leave for good this time. But, of course... The huge problem for her was, and you've got to remember the morals and the social attitudes of the time. She had left her husband and was still married to Constantine Mm. and Mm. remained married to him for 20 years. He kept pressurizing his mother, the Dowager Empress, Maria, um, was it Maria Maria Alexeyevna? Um, I can't remember remember her patronymic, sorry, mm-hmm. um, the Dowager Empress, who was also German, of course. She'd been a young German bride. Um, he kept begging his mother after she was widowed to allow him to get a divorce, but she refused because she didn't want that kind of dishonour and scandal brought on the Russian mm-hmm. imperial family. Julie was desperate for a divorce as well, but it it was not until 1820 that Alexander mm-hmm. finally was able, you know, to get to grant her the right to divorce. So all that time, she was living in a bit of a, um, a, a sort of, uh, she wasn't quite acceptable in society, and yet she wasn't totally reclusive. Mm-hmm. But she led quite a peripatetic life, traveling around Napoleonic Europe in that first 14 years or so. She left in 1801. And it wasn't till 1814 that she finally settled in Switzerland. Right. That's that's an amazing story. Um, I'm very much looking forward to 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 the fruition of the of the research. I was curious because I can see certain uh, certain familiar faces on the bookshelf behind you. Uh, how she compares oh, yeah. <laughs> to how the how the writing and research you know going into creating the book how she compares to, say, writing about Mary Seacole. Um, you said there isn't a lot of words from Julie. Um, and I know that Mary Seacole did write something herself. So how does the, how is the two experiences compare? Well, they're two very different subjects. I mean, the problem with Julie was for the really important moments of her life, like possibly two certainly but possibly three illegitimate children i have the nightmare of not really being able to point the finger except at one of the daddies Mm -hmm. so it's internally frustrating it's very difficult getting to her inner life whereas with mary she she at least wrote a memoir of her time in the crimea and, and also in panama just before it With Julie, there are some letters a bit later after she... I mean, they're very, very sparse for the first few years. But once she'd settled pretty much in Switzerland, there are more letters then. And, and, you know, she's got this habit they all have at the time of starting a letter in French and then Mm -hmm. breaking into German and then going back to French. And, uh, oh, anyway, (laughs) at least I do have some letters. But getting to primary source material from her has required a lot of searching. Mm -hmm. And the real issue for me, I mean, this is an archival problem more than anything, that the material I needed was in the Coburg Staatsarchiv. Um, And I don't know if anyone is familiar with the Staatsarchiv, but a lot of the 18th century, certainly the early stuff, um, has the most Byzantine system of um archiving and 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 the whole cataloging and or not cataloging of it is very very arcane and difficult to understand lots and lots of folders it's all current schrift hand squiggly oh, right. hand mm-hmm. can't read 
I couldn't have read any of the letters anyway because I my German is uh, my German is not as good. In, you know, it's just fairly fairly basic compared to my Russian mm -hmm. and my French. So I had to get someone to go to Kobo for me because there's no point me even going there. I wouldn't have been able to read any of it. Mm -hmm. And also he said, you need to, this German guy who went for me, he said, you really need to know where to go and where to look or you'll never find anything. Mm -hmm. He said a lot of cataloging, sort of cataloging in commas there, uh, was done in the 19th century and it's never been upgraded. So the Coburg archives, um, they've probably got wonderful things if you can mm -hmm. find them. But it's not be, an easy. Be argument. warned, be warned, researchers. <laughs> Anyone going to code work, it's really tough. You've got to be able to read the squiggly handwriting. Yes. And, right. and 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 like I said, the cataloging numbering system is weird and mm. difficult. But you know, there there are plus and minuses in all research. And uh, uh, on the obverse of that, I discovered from a fellow researcher who's writing. Uh, who's working on a biography of Leopold, Julie's brother. Uh, I, think I, know who you're talking, I think I know who you're talking about, yes. <laughs> Christopher Guyver, <laughs> yes. right? Christopher Guyver told me, he when he because he, he volunteered very kindly because he was going to Belgium. He said, I'll have to try and find out what's in Fond Goffiné for you. And he emailed me and said, yes, there are some Julie letters to Leopold, but they're not probably catalogued or anything. But um, if you, here's the uh, email of the art head archivist there. Uh, you can but write him a begging email, as I do all the time. Yeah, yeah we, all we, all do. we all do. We all do. Begging <laughs> emails around the world, especially during COVID. Um, and so I wrote him this begging email saying, I hear that there are Julie letters to Leopold. Can you tell me anything about them? The date span or, you know, how many or anything? Because... Uh, I, I, at the time, I thought, I don't know how I can get to Belgium. Because, again, if they're in German, I can't read them anyway. Mm. Um, so and I can't believe it still. The following day, by return of email, I had an attachment with 165 scans. I remember the And tweet. that wonderful I man to give me, I can't remember his name because um, it, it, it was Flemish. But... Mm. Um, wonderful kind archivist he said none of them are catalogued yet they were in a cellar somewhere at Van Gogh so they'd never been folioed so you, it, literally they were just a mess just a pile of <laughs> but he sent me all the scans and then in a great act of generosity uh, Christopher Guyver looked through them for me and pulled out any bits he thought might be of interest because you know, the thing is, you can, this is the thing with archival research, you can traipse all that way, spend a lot of money, hotels, fairs, this, that and the other. You get there, you get the file, and there's nothing interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And everyone's had that experience, and then what you hope to find isn't there. Well, in the case of Julie's letters to Leopold, they aren't as exciting as I'd hoped. Um, because mainly, as Christopher told me, it's uh, mainly her chit-chatting about uh, the Belgian royal family and Queen Louise. And mm. uh, there were one or two telling things that did Christopher, thank God, spotted for mm -hmm. me. But I think, you know, say I'd gone to all that trouble and expense to go to Belgium, what would I have come home with? So I am a great believer in cases like that of asking someone who can, ask, admitting the limits to your knowledge and your expertise mm -hmm. and, and paying other people who have much better skills at a particular language than you have. And I've done this with all my work because when I did the book on um, how they couldn't save the Romanovs and get them out of Russia, mm -hmm. I needed to access sources in Swedish, um, Dutch, uh, Danish, Norwegian, German. I had to find people to help me. Mm -hmm. I couldn't speak all those languages. And it costs money. That's the only thing. If you if yeah. you need, if you hire good people, I've got a wonderful um, researcher who's been helping me with German material in the Royal Archives. You, you've got to pay them properly. You do. And I do believe. And, and, you know, you can't get things on the cheap. And you cannot expect people always to do you big favours by doing it for nothing. No, no. Now, this is this is completely true uh, about the, the trials of archival research because 
you could the, the, the thing you're looking for either won't be there or you'll spend a week there and only at the end get a lead on what you're looking for and have to come back um yeah. and like you say language is a massive barrier for a lot of people anyway uh many people can speak one or two read maybe you know enough of some but it's uh i think what i think what um the the important thing you're pointing out here and i think uh, you you know researchers watching this will i think be that that's really good advice for anybody watching this who who feels a little stuck um i think the the message there speaks to the very the very helpful and open nature of of the historical community i've always found oh, yeah. that people mm. are very willing to help um so long people as you people are incredibly generous mm. i have in i've you know i'm on my 17th book now and there hasn't been a time when someone has not offered help that has really made a difference for me even at times given me a breakthrough into comprehending something that i couldn't make sense of and I always search for experts, and I, I remember one particular example, if we've got time, mm -hmm. but, it, but it's an interesting one. When I did the, my book on the murder of the Romanovs called Ekaterinburg, which was just about the last two weeks of their lives in the Apartheid house, I needed to understand the forensics and the ballistics of what happens when you put a group of people in a dark basement room and start firing at them at random. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I, how can I find someone? You know, I need to understand what happens to bodies. What's it like with all the guns going off? You know, um, and so I searched on the web for forensics and ballistics people. In the end, I found this wonderful man who was an expert witness, forensics, ballistics, expert witness, who'd actually um, been involved in the deep cut inquiry and various quite you know, right. high profile cases. Anyway, so he, he I sent him <laughs> one of my begging emails. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said, look, and I explained what I was doing. I need to understand what happens with, with guns and this, that and the other. And I said, is there any chance you could possibly spare me an hour of your time? And what, what are your fees? Mm -hmm. And his response was to me, I'll happily talk to you for the price of a lunch. Yeah. So... <laughs> Wonderful man, mm -hmm. extraordinary man, um, so knowledgeable, so experienced. Mm -hmm. I met him in this little bistro somewhere in near Bromley, I think. And um, five hours later, <laughs> I emerged and he just explained the whole thing to me. And having that explanation and reams of notes that I took during that lunch, I was able to write the chapter on the killings from several different perspectives of the killers, the victims, what happens with the guns, what happens to human bodies when you're shooting at them, you know, mm -hmm. and I got the full scenario. And that's where it really pays off to search and find someone who knows Mm -hmm. fantastic yes absolutely um I, I, and i'm I sure in your field it must be the same with napoleonic wars yes there must be brilliant people out there who understand all about the the the, the munitions side of it the guns the weapons the, yep. the the military formations it's fascinating yes it's the same in every sphere of, of history i think and like you say the 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 military side of the napoleonic wars is exactly the same you have people who spend their lives researching the uniforms of a particular yeah. army sometimes a particular regiment so they'll know that specific sometimes sometimes yes amongst reenacting circles you'll have people yeah. ex expert in the year 1812 for the uh, issue of uh, equipment and uniforms um, well, they'd know if a button was wrong or the wrong yes, airport. Yes, they would. Yes. Uh, these, the, these are like the guys I know in the Crimean War Research Society, which mm. is my specialist war. They know from a mile off if a uniform's <laughs> wrong, a medal's wrong. Yes. They're brilliant. You yes, know, they their are. absolute knowledge is mm -hmm. astonishing. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> that's that's it's there are so many people to um that can help. I often wish that there was a sort of a historians compendium sort of website somewhere that you could go to to like ask for experts you know like oh, ask... what a good idea yeah a collective kind of ready reference where i you know i need to know about napoleonic uniforms in 1815 
click this link and you'll exactly. find something. Exactly. Yeah, I need to know about the German duchies when Napoleon invaded in, in 18... Was, I think it was 1806, was it, or 1805? I can't remember. When Saxe Coburg was invaded. Now mm -hmm. I'm looking for an expert on that. Okay, well, if, uh, if anybody is watching, <laughs> or if anybody who's watching knows uh, where to go, <laughs> even if it's just a book that you think is a particularly yeah. good source, we want to know that author so we can help mm -hmm. Helen out uh, because that's. I would need help to find out <laughs> about that. <laughs> well, I, I know it was occupied for a, for a short while and they mm. finally got it back a few years later, but um, it, it's very difficult finding the useful source mm. of that. Mm -hmm. so, and mm. I need to check up on it. So. And it, it's, it's partly because um, this part of the Napoleonic Wars, like I said before, it's dominated by um, the Peninsular War wellington yeah and and, and russia yeah invasion. exactly yeah. uh 1812 with napoleon a bit of you know it depends napoleon's napoleon's famous battles we'll call it are the other bits that are focused yeah. on uh very little in english to be honest though um and so uh, these sorts of subjects which are ripe for somebody to write about uh don't get the attention that other things have uh yeah. this the the entire german uh sphere to be honest from uh the beginning of the wars uh, the resumption of the wars i should say in 1801 1802 to 1815 uh, are probably massive there's probably masses of stuff you could get into original sources and things in various uh archives and I'm, I could continue talking for a very long time about all these sorts of things, but we are running out of time on the call. <laughs> We're running out of time, but I'm also, I've got to, I've got to get my head around Tilsit. Oh, right, about, yes. Around yes. Leipzig. Oh, right, yes. And Leopold's successes, Prince Leopold, you know, his success is there. Mm -hmm. um, because all of these impinge on Julie's story because all her siblings come weave in and out of her story once right. she's left Russia because you know her sister marries into the British royals Leopold marries the princess of Wales you know mm. there's constant cross currents in the story constant toing and froing across Germany and in and out of Switzerland because people mm -hmm. visited her there yes so if anyone has any sightings of Julian of Saxe-Coburg Saalfeld, uh, aka Anna Fyodorovna of Russia, in Switzerland from 18, well, no, in Europe after 1801 when she left. I'm please, I'm here. <laughs> We, I hope, I hope we'll be able to help you out with that. And some of those names are very uh, important names in the Napoleonic story. And I can assure you yeah. that, as far as Tilsit and Leipzig go, there'll be a lot to look. Oh, and that, she was very that... friendly too with Capodistria. Right, right. Okay. Um, she, she with uh, uh, something to do with Alexander supporting Swiss mm -hmm. independence and and the the Vaud story, which is all very complicated. I haven't mm -hmm. really got into that yet, but she certainly corresponded and met politicians and all kinds of people when she was in Switzerland. She sounds like a a, a wonderful subject to write a book on i'm so glad you're doing it and i'm so glad to be able to help you in any way i can well thank you it's and hard it it's is. very hard it in is. a way i've chosen probably <laughs> my most difficult subject yet <laughs> but uh helen it's been lovely to talk to you today uh we're on one minute so it's going to cut us off in a second um but I hope we can uh, do another video at some point and talk more about history and Julie and other things like that. But thank you so much for your time and coming to talk to me today. Well, it's a pleasure, Josh. Thank you for asking me. Thank you. And I, I look forward to more encounters. <laughs> uh, as do I. Uh, as usual, um, links and things in the description box. Please like and subscribe. And we'll see you for another Adventure in History Land the next time. Thank you.